Welcome back to another episode of Chat with the Archaeologist, presented by the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. We've got a great show today with Paul Reed as our guest, who will be talking about his recent conservation efforts in the greater Chaco landscape. But first, we have a number of announcements, and there's a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, to get started, uh, of course, we have to address tours. We get calls for tours um, constantly, and we are thrilled for your interest. We're still targeting July to resume tours. We don't have an exact date, but look for uh, availabilities for tour times definitely on Saturdays, probably on Wednesdays as well. We haven't opened our booking system yet, but look, look for that soon as that's in the works as well. That will be on our website, and when we open it, we will also make an announcement on our Facebook page, and we'll probably send out a newsletter to folks on our newsletter subscription list. When the system is open, uh, on our webpage, you will go to the left-hand side, click on Visit the Preserve, and there will be more instructions on how to book a tour time and date. So we are excited to bring that to you, and we understand that everyone has been incredibly patient. We, we appreciate that patience and the continued interest in the meantime, to help you get your fix of petroglyphs, the Archaeological Conservancy has just released their four-part mini-series giving a virtual tour of the Wells Petroglyph Preserve. The Wells Petroglyph Preserve, owned by the Archaeological Conservancy, is where we hold our tours, where we will be holding our tours, once again, starting in July. So if you can't wait until July, be sure to head over to the Archaeological Conservancy's Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channel where you can find a link to this series, either as four individual uh, videos or as a compilation. We also have a link in the description down below to help you find it all the much better. And we thank you, everyone at the Archaeological Conservancy who came out and helped make this happen. It was... Uh, it was wonderful working with you all, and so everyone in the audience, please uh, go over to that. If, after watching that, you don't get your fix, then I have more good news for you. Because this month, we're going to be releasing two new virtual reality tours on our website. In order not to not steal the Archaeological Conservancy's thunder, we haven't released them yet. Look for those, the first of those, starting at the end of next week and then another one following shortly. So those virtual reality tours, for those of you who uh, haven't checked them out, they are currently on a web-based platform. That means you can go to them on your computer, on your smartphone, on your tablet, what have you. And there are themed tours. So our existing tours are heraldic lions and shield bearers, and we'll be releasing two new themed tours uh, I don't want to spoil it. You'll just have to watch for them. And uh, so these will give you a sort of uh, a stop, a petroglyph panel to be featured in sequence. And then that you can kind of full screen. You can view it in virtual reality mode on virtual reality capable devices and really situate yourself in this immersive experience of not just the petroglyph panel, but the environment around it as well. So keep an eye out for those. Again, the first of those two new virtual reality tours is going to be released at the end of next week. If, after watching the Archaeological Conservancy's virtual tour, you don't have your fill, and you can't wait until next week to uh, enjoy the VR tours, then those of you who are members of the American Rock Art Research Association, or ARARA, can watch my talk tomorrow morning where I will be giving more virtual reality experiences of parrots, macaws, raptors, and their archeological context, and what they say about connections between the Pueblos and Mesoamerican cultures to the South. So for those of you who are Arara members, tune in for that, that'll be on Zoom. With all this talk of virtual reality, virtual tours, and Zoom meetings, here on this webcast, it's very clear that the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project is getting with the 2020s. 
in that spirit, we are excited to announce that we now also accept crypto. That's right. You can donate to the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project using Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, whatever cryptocurrency that you want. There is a link, well, on our website, on the landing page, the main page, the big old button, contribute with cryptocurrency. So I'm just giving you another way that you can support the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, not just programs like these, but also programs like our Summer Youth Intern Program, which will be starting up next week. So that's what I'm going to be doing for the next two weeks. And that is just one of our many efforts to engage in education for the public and particularly with youth. So visit our webpage, donate using crypto, experience some virtual reality, and there's obviously even more to that, but uh, that should get you started. I hope that, um, hope that makes everyone a bit happier here. And before I take up all the time, we're going to hand it over to Paul. There we go. Um, usual mic issues. Uh, so, Paul, uh, preservation archaeologist with uh, Archaeology Southwest. Uh, as usual, um, I ask our guests, uh, where did you go to school? Yeah, I, I studied at New Mexico State down in Las Cruces. Great. Um, so shout out to New Mexico State, and as I understand, uh, you also do a uh, regular, it was a regular radio show. Is that correct? Right, I do. Um, yeah, I've recently moved to um, the Taos area, but I spent a lot of time in Farmington, New Mexico, in the northwest corner, and I uh, got linked up with the college radio station there. It's KSJE at San Juan College. And the host Scott. So on first Thursday, and we talk and then you know, eat things going on with the research projects I'm doing. And then we've had really since, especially with COVID going on, a really great run of um, different guests. So it's 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 been a lot of fun. Wonderful. Um, Sorry, uh, we had some uh, glitchy audio there for a second, but it, it looks like you, our uh, connection has stabilized. Um, I'll let you know if we have any more connection issues. So uh, for anyone sure. who uh, wants their extra fix of archeology, span um, tune in to that after this. And um, when, when can they tune in, Paul? Um, the next one will be the first Thursday in July, so that's going to be um, Thursday, July 1st. So, yeah, just a couple weeks, three weeks, I guess. Wonderful. All right. Um, Paul, I'm going to hand it over to you for your talk, and I'm going to duck off the air here. So take it away. All right. Thanks, Jester, and, and thanks so much for inviting me to be part of your chat with an archaeologist. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's, all right, so um, I have been fortunate to be working now for seven years um, on a project that, you know, we pretty much render the way my title here on the talk says protecting the greater Chaco landscape. Um, so I've done that through my employment as a preservation archeologist with Tucson-based Archeology span Southwest. I've been with Archeology span Southwest for 20 years uh, this summer, 
um, working mostly in uh, the Farmington area. I did a lot of work at Solomon Ruins. I've done projects different parts of New Mexico. But for the last seven years, I've been in the area north of Taos and continuing to work on a number of these pursuits. So just real quick, um, Archaeology Southwest is a nonprofit um, group that practices a holistic conservation-based approach to preserving the places of the past we all share. Um, the term preservation archaeology was coined by our founder, Bully. And what makes this special is that we employ a number of different strategies. Um, we are working with site protection strategies. We do archaeological research. We engage in a lot of Native American engagement. And, um, you know, like I'm doing with this talk with Chester, we do a lot of public outreach and advocacy. Um, and those are things that make Archaeology Southwest mission, um, you know, what we hope it'll be. So as we've done work for the last seven years on what we call the Greater Chaco Initiative, we've had the partners that you see on your screen. Um, and, you know, this is something that has really made our work, you know, as a single uh, individual nonprofit or NGO organization really have so much more impact. And I think um, all of the groups represented on the screen would agree. We get together, um, we're in a coalition that works to protect Greater Chaco from mostly um, the effects of oil and gas leasing. And that's really what I want to focus on during this talk. Um, two of our part central partners are in the middle of the screen, the El Pueblo Council of Governors, which is the gathering of the 20 governors of the New Mexico Pueblos, along with Isleta del Sur down in El Paso. And the Pueblo of Acoma has been a special partner for us for several years. So what have we done? Um, well, over the last seven years, we've engaged uh, with the partners that I just discussed with you. And basically our engagement has involved multiple federal agencies. So we work with BLM, BIA, the National Park Service, Forest Service. We've spent quite a bit of time engaging with New Mexico's State Historic Preservation Officer in Santa Fe and, that, and the folks in that office. We've worked with the New Mexico State Land Commissioner, um, Stephanie Garcia Richard. Uh, since he's been in office three years now, has been an amazing partner, done a lot of good things. Um, we engage with um, our congressional delegation. And as I mentioned, we do outreach with um, tribal governors, with the Navajo Nation. We have an, a project in the works with Zuni Pueblo. Um, and then I do things like this lecture. Um, we do a lot of public lectures. I do tours to Chaco talking about the preservation issues. We've sponsored several public forums. We've had workshops. And then finally, real active press engagement. Um, we've had a number of op-eds that have appeared in New Mexico newspapers, an article in Science Magazine, um, lots of articles going into Farmington's Daily Times, since Farmington is kind of at the epicenter of this effort. And then the other thing that we've done, more in the realm of archaeological research, is to um, acquire the funding through private grantors. And we've studied um Chaco landscape and roads so we did a lidar you know which is laser detection studies um of indivisible in nearly invisible features that we see on the landscape um we completed an ethnographic study with the Pueblo of Acoma in the last couple of years um we have one planned with the Pueblo of Zuni for later this year and then last year um during some of the challenges we all had with COVID-19 and the pandemic and the shutdowns we were able to get out into Chaco's 10 mile zone of protection, which I'm gonna kind of zero in on later. Um, and we were able um, to work out there. And this is an area that does not have a whole lot of, of people living currently on land and really kind of an ideal place ultimately to practice social distancing um, over last year. So I'm an archeologist, we need maps. Um, let's zero in here. So we've got Chaco Canyon right in here in the middle in red. And then what this map has for you um, is Solomon Ruins as well, Aztec Ruins. This is an area I focused a lot of my research on. Um, what we've also have though are all of the Pueblos and the tribes who live in this portion of um, the Four Corners area. So a lot of our work at Archaeology Southwest has focused on partnering with tribes and we're in the process right now of trying to improve those partnerships, build on them, and develop more collaborative research projects um, like what we've done on Chaco. Um, so I'm gonna fly right into it for you here. This is a flare. 
So this is an oil company burning off excess um, methane, natural gas, and what actually ends up being quite a bit of nitrogen as well. So just a quick, quick uh, technical primer here. When um, companies drill in to get oil, um, natural gas beds in with oil. There's really no way to separate them as they come up, you know, through whatever, however deep they've drilled. In this case, we're talking about the Mancos Shale Formation in the area around Chaco and up towards Farmington. So they go down about a mile, 5,000 feet. And in the process of bringing up primarily oil, in this case is what they're seeking, there's a whole lot of gas that comes up. So this is, again, primarily nitrogen, but there's quite a bit of methane or natural gas. And because of the regulations that are currently in place, companies are allowed to go ahead and flare this, burn it off. Um, and this process usually lasts just a few days, perhaps a couple of weeks. And you know, I've had this explained to me by federal agency folks as a, a fairly minimal impact. The problem is this is a product that should be collected um, and should you know, pay royalties um, into the public offers. And that's not what's happening right now. Um, the other thing we have on the landscape is a pretty substantial footprint. So this is obviously an oil storage yard. You see a bunch of tanks, trucks, other facilities that are associated with how the oil and gas companies do their work. We have um, untold hundreds, thousands of these areas across the landscape in Greater Chaco. And it is part of the challenge that we're facing as we try to figure out how to protect resources. Um, this map is a couple of years old actually, but I love the impact that this shows um, as we're talking about you know, the extent of federal leasing in the area. Um, the magenta that you see on the screen, these are all active leases, okay? Chaco Canyon sits right in here in the middle of our screen, and you can basically see this magenta ocean um, of development that's in the area north of Chaco. Um, this has greatly impacted this ancient landscape. Um, another map for you. Um, this in blue shows what was on the prior screen in magenta. So again, you can see the extent of the oil and gas leasing that um, basically fills almost the entire screen from Chaco here in the center, going all the way up to the site at Salmon, which is here, over to Aztec Ruins and all the way to the Colorado State Line. We're focused on New Mexico, but there are thousands of wells in Southwest Colorado as well. So this area is a super active oil and gas um, development area. The first well was sunk um, out by Shiprock, right in here, not on our map, um, in about 1922. So we were literally at 100 years, pretty darn close, of development in this oil field. Um, so, you know, what are we working on? What have we been working on to try and address this? Um, we were fortunate to have um, a Chaco Protection Bill be drafted um, with various input from our organization from the partners that I showed you in the prior screens, prior slides. And this was um, presented in the House of Representatives in early 2019. This bill essentially would remove 303,000, that's 303 k acres of federal land in the circles that you see here with this little jog to the north. This would remove the federal lands from oil and gas leasing. And this would be permanent as long as this law is in effect. Um, this passed our U.S. House of Representatives with then Representative um, Ben Ray Lujan shepherding it, pushing it. Um, it got into the Senate and then stalled in the Resources Committee. Um, at this point, of course, the political situation has changed and an updated version of this bill will be introduced by our new Congresswoman, Teresa Ledger Fernandez. Uh, we think either later this month or in early July. Uh, Senator Lujan is going to introduce a companion bill in the Senate, and um, we're hoping that this, get, this gets through and that President Biden signs this. This would then provide permanent protection for these areas that are outlined in here. This would remove the federal lands, and I want to make be real clear about that because there has been some confusion. As you look at this map, the federal lands, the public lands are in yellow. Um, these tan lands are Navajo Nation, so with the reservation boundary somewhere out here, and then a mix of uh, Navajo Nation allotted lands, which are very close to private, but which are individuals who have allotments that date back to the 19th century. The blue lands are state lands. 
So we have in this area what people refer to as the checkerboard. It's a real mix of land jurisdiction. So this federal bill begins the process of protecting these lands. It, what it does not do, it does not impact any Navajo Nation tribal members who have allotments or lands they hold from doing different types of development. And that has been unfortunately reported in the media and incorrectly so. So what are we excited about in 2021, along with that, the bill being introduced? Our new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland. Um, you know, Secretary Holland has already begun a comprehensive program of reviewing and assessing the way federal leasing is happening in the West, really across the nation, but we're, we're focused on lands in the West. So the report from the Department of Interior uh, is supposed to be out here perhaps before the end of the month um, by July 1. So we're looking forward to that with a lot of anticipation. Um, so what we're looking at in, in terms of federal management then around Greater Chaco um, is a process that's been underway for a while. And this is, was really the spur that, that got me and Archaeology Southwest involved seven years ago. This was BLM initially deciding to modify their resource management plan. Um, this is an RMP, a resource management plan, and an amendment, so it becomes an RMPA, and an environmental impact statement. Those are rolled into a fairly complicated process. But this has been underway for seven years. Um, under the prior administration, um, we nearly had what we considered a bad plan, a bad amendment, and a bad EIS getting through and, and becoming law. So that process basically terminated in January um, with the Biden administration um, when President Biden was inaugurated on January 20th. So that came to a halt. At this point, um, the Department of Interior under Deb Holland, the BLM under a director that we're waiting to have confirmed is going to basically redress, take another look at this process. And we're hoping that we get um, really a better plan out of this, one that prioritizes protection of sensitive, fragile, irreplaceable cultural resources across this landscape, and that also protects the Navajo families that are living out in the area. That's something that was not a big priority under the prior administration. Um, so as I mentioned, the Chaco Protection Bill, um, you know, with a few tweaks from 2019, um, is going to be reintroduced. and. You know, we're optimistic that that could happen. So what our organization has done specifically to assist in this process of understanding what's in, in particular, the 10 mile zone around Chaco is an archeological reconnaissance. Now, this is a, a term that means a lot of different things to different people. In an archeological sense, this is different from what we would call an intensive pedestrian or walking survey of as many acres as we could do. So I know with the work that's been done out on Mesa Prieta that there's been a lot of intensive survey of most of those lands. So in Chaco's 10 mile zone, um, that area, those three circles on the map that I showed you encompass an area of almost 700,000 acres. So a conservative estimate for surveying that, even with large crews, is decades of work. And what we have in there, as you see on the screen here, is roughly 4,200 known archaeological and historic sites, hundreds of tribal traditional cultural places and properties. So instead of trying to bite off a huge project, and you know we would have been really unable to survey more than a tenth or a tenth of a percent, uh, a tenth of a tenth of a percent of this area, um, my focus was on the known sites and some of the known communities in the area and areas that to this point have had no additional federal protection. So we have a number of sites that are part of what's called um, the Chaco Culture Protection Sites. And these are areas that uh, have extensive Chaco and Great Houses and other remains and are under some kinds of federal protection. Many of the sites in this area are not. So that was an area um, that was really our main focus. What we have in this area then, with these roughly 4,200 known sites, and I'm going to throw out a number, perhaps five times, ten times that number of additional sites, so perhaps tens of thousands of other sites, we have episodic use of the area by a diverse cultural group, um, many diverse groups, Paleo-Indian way back between 5,000 and about 12,000 BC. We've got archaic groups from 
5000 BC and to the more recent era. We have Pueblo folks on the landscape from 600 BC. We have the Navajo, we have Hickory Apache, and we have many others, this long period of occupation. What we also have then with many of these scattered sites is at least 10 significant ancient Chaco Puebloan communities and dozens of dispersed Navajo homesteads, outfits, and communities. So really quite an extensive cultural resource um, area. This is a map that shows um, with some blurring so that we don't give away site locations what we know of in our New Mexico site database at this point. And this is information that I acknowledge um, the New Mexico uh, Office of Cultural Affairs and the folks who work on their state database. Um, Derek Pierce in particular, their manager. So these areas of red and sort of faded red and pink show, give you a rough sense of density. And um, Chaco Canyon here, the Chaco Culture National Historical Park is here. I excluded those areas so we could rather highlight the area around it. So we have, you know, pretty significant clusters of sites. Um, and ancient communities, more recent Navajo communities. Most of these don't enjoy any additional level of federal protection that happens just anywhere on our landscapes. And that's one of our concerns. Um, so as part of this work then, I went in and I wanted to assess these clusters of sites. And you can see some of those identified here, split lip flats site cluster, one that's uh, called Northeast of Chaco site cluster. There are known communities that have been studied by others, the Pisani community here, the Pierre's community, um, one called Kin Indian, Escavada, Greasy Hill community. <clears throat> These are areas where fairly dense concentrations of people lived on the land at different points in time. So these are, these tend to be natural focal points for study. And again, with the exception of Pierre's and Bassani, none of these places enjoy any additional level of extra federal protection. So that's where, as I show you the boundaries here of at least the prior 2019 cultural, Chaco Cultural Protection Act boundary, this is why we need extra protection for these areas. Um, just zeroing in for a sense, for a second here, we've got the Pierre's community. This was defined initially way back in the early 70s. Um, and this is just showing you a rough boundary. Again, we don't reveal site locations out of concerns for protection. There's 166 sites in this area. Um, <clears throat> giving you rough acreage, this is an area roughly uh, 400, 500 acres. So what we'd say archeologically is a pretty dense collection of sites. These are not all from the same time period. That's why it's called a site cluster, not a community. Um, there's been work done defining the Chacoan, Pueblo, and Pierre's community. Really not any work on the other communities. There are sites as early as 5000 BC. There's a very interesting Basket Maker III um, period. There is an early Navajo site that dates, I think, right in the late 1500s, early 1600s. There's a lot we can learn from this. Um, and then one of the other things I want to highlight for you on the map is um, this area in green. Um, this is an area of critical environmental concern or what we term an ACEC. These are defined on BLM lands in the American West as areas that need special treatment. So in this case, this one in the middle here was defined to capture the core of the Pierre's community of the ancient Chacon community there. This community roughly dates from the late 900s to the mid 1100s. Um, and then the area going up here is part of the North Road, which comes out of Chaco Canyon and hits this point at Pierre's about 10 to 11 miles north of Chaco, then continues all the way up um, to the edge of Coots Canyon. Um, I highlight this for you though, because here's the known extent of sites and here is the area that the federal agencies, BLM in this case, have decided chosen to set aside for protection. You can see this slice is right through the middle, but it really doesn't cover enough of this community to constitute what we would call a uh, good, good protection for this durably. Um, map here I want to highlight by one of my archaeological colleagues up at Crow Canyon, um, Kellum Throgmorton worked with me on this. So this is the Pierre's community. Let me shift back for a minute. So this map is going to sit right in here in the middle of our frame. Um, this, of course, is an aerial photograph, so you can see Chaco and Great House is here, here, 
Here is the Great North Road alignment coming up, being difficult to detect as it continues north. There are features up on Mesa tops here. All these square rooms are elevated features, and then just a number of small pueblos in this, this very dense um, Chacoan Pueblo and community. Um, another area um, that I've termed the split lips flat cluster. Um, this one must have had some interesting history to have made for that name, split lips flat, perhaps some, some dry, dusty walking uh, and some thirst leading to those split lips. This is an area of 267 sites, so quite a few more than the Pierre's cluster. Also, you know, sort of an interesting elongated shape. This, this comes, of course, from mapping the known sites. This area has been comprehensively surveyed in the areas that make up these clusters. There's other areas that could certainly <clears throat> have more surveys to flesh this out. Um, 28 sites down here on the Ashley Schlepa Road. This is one that comes from Escovado Wash, which flows into Chaco Canyon. This is a road. This is an ancient Chacoan road that goes up to the Northwest and reaches into the heart of the Split Lips um, community. There is not, interestingly enough, what we would term a Chaco and Great House or central site location in the site cluster. Um, so this road has been somewhat of an enigma as folks have tried to study it. Um, again, though, this is on the map and in my discussion to highlight, you know, this is an ancient Chaco and road. Here is a BLM ACEC one of these areas of special environmental concern. Here's the one from Pierre's to orient us. Okay, here's a section on the North Road where the road was clearly visible on the ground. Where it's not visible, BLM chooses to offer no protection, which I think is a little bit problematic. And then with this, you know, this long area of, of road heading into a pretty dense site cluster, and again, sites of multiple time periods, we have a relatively small ECEC identifying some cultural concerns. You know, it could be environmental concerns. In this case, they're cultural. This area is not adequately protected, in my opinion. Um, then we can zero in. Then this is on that same road segment. So let me roll back. Here's our Ashley Schlepa Road. Here's another outstanding map by my colleague, uh, Kellum Throgmorton. And here is where the road trends up through here. There is a ramp that descends down to cross Escovado Wash, going up, going up, going up. So Callum brings some great mapping skills to this. This is a site known as Los Aguajes um, for collection points, basically potholes that collect water. And you know, there's an amazing um, diversity of archaeology sites like this out here. And this again drives home the point that in this 10-mile zone, which you know we again have federal legislation pending. This is not an arbitrary area that was thrown out to say, hey, let's let's just put some kind of buffer zone around Chaco. It was a carefully chosen area that has all this amazing archaeology. And in this short presentation, I'm really giving folks just a taste of it. Um, this next one is in the Basani community. This is on the eastern extension of Escovado Wash, which we saw over here looking at those road sites. This is a cluster, a very dense cluster of about 61 sites that are mostly in the late Chaco period, um, focused on the great houses. And, the, and um, nearby that, going off just to the east, is a cluster of sites on Chaco's northeast boundary. Um, and this has several early Navajo sites from folks coming back from the Long Walk in the mid to late 1800s and settling in this area. So some very interesting archaeology. Uh, none of these have been studied beyond um, development projects, um, maybe a home site lease for a family, uh, a line bringing in power, a water line, and of course the ubiquitous oil and gas development. Um, and this map I think really helps illustrate one of the points that's been central to really my work over the last seven years. We have a whole bunch of point locations here. These are all archaeological sites. Um, of varying sizes, just shown here with no boundaries, again, to safeguard their locations. Um, we go back to the prior map, we see that when we group up sites and draw circles around them, um, and again, we're not trying to say this is a specific ancient boundary where people didn't cross over, but this is an archaeological defined cluster of community sites that relate to at least the Chaco and community out here. So there's a whole lot going on inside this area. As we look at the individual sites presented here, 
um, this tends to give us a sense that these are isolated areas. And the fact is, um, most of these sites are connected to others of the same time period. We might have a residential site with an area where plants were gathered or where lithic stone material was gathered to build, where wood was procured. So we have all these sites coming together to build these communities, essentially. Um, and so we really don't want to focus just on these individual sites. We want to look at these larger areas and say, maybe this entire community site is something that we should protect archaeologically. Now, unfortunately, the way archaeological cultural resource protection work is done today, these sites get identified. And if a company wants to put, say, an oil or gas pipeline in between these, these aerials will be defined and they will essentially thread the needle and put that pipeline between it. What this does over time is it completely compromises the nature of this ancient landscape, and in this case, the historic Navajo landscape. So that eventually we do end up with islands of protected areas that might have more natural vegetation regimes, but where there are intrusive plants outside because it's been blighted off for oil and gas infrastructure, pipelines, et cetera. So this is really not an adequate way, in my view, to protect this landscape. I am going to stop there. This is a closing slide of a 3D reconstruction by a, a colleague at Archaeology Southwest. And I am glad to take questions when we get to that part of the segment, Chester, or proceed. Let me go ahead and stop my share. And we're back. And I just want to make sure. Uh, yeah, OK, we've got sound. I just have, have to double check that. That's my uh, my number one error here. I'm going to check the chat sure. for some questions. And uh, I actually think I have a few questions for you too, Paul. Um, Good. I don't see any here. But um, uh, Paul, I'm assuming you're familiar with uh, Ruth Van Dyke's recent work on the Greater Chaco soundscape. Um, is that something that you could uh, share with our audience? Is, is that complimentary to your work? It definitely is. And in fact, for the work at Pierre's, um, let me actually roll back if I can, Chester, if that's not too big of a problem. Um, let me, all right, here we go. So let me go back to my Pierre's site um, cluster. So yeah, um, Ruth and I were talking and Ruth has been um, one of my primary partners um, as well beyond sort of the environmental groups I showed. Didn't mention any of our university partners, but Ruth is one, Carrie Heitman at the University of Nebraska, another really close partner. What we did in conversation, we talked about ways to better understand the Pierre's community specifically. So Ruth said, you know, it'd be great to do a soundscape. Um, and view shed analysis of Pierre's. So um, we had some money that had come through one of our grantors working to protect Greater Chaco. So we made some funds available and Ruth took out a team and in 2017 and did a fabulous study um, that we can, uh, I believe she has shared that publicly and folks can access that. So I'll get you that information, Chester. But essentially what Ruth was trying to document was the impacts again to this entire community um, from oil and gas coming onto the landscape. So um, I'm going to give you some approximates here because I don't have Ruth's map in this particular presentation. But with the cluster of sites here and the great houses at Pierre's, there is a well pad, an oil gas well pad that was placed about a quarter of a mile of away from those great houses. When you go out there on a day where the wind isn't blowing and you're out, as many of us are, to experience an archaeological site, you want to get a sense of um, perhaps why the Pueblo builders chose this location, you know, and, and trying to understand it in its landscape. You climb up on the mesa, you're trying to get a grasp on what, you know, this fairly small great house, a little oxymoronic there, but it's a, one of the smaller great houses in the Chaco world, but an amazing structure on a mesa. Um, in fact, it's in my, my background here. This is the site of Pierre's. Um, and you go up on there. You're looking at the architecture, the wind dies down, um, you're trying to experience it. The first thing you hear is the thumping of the well pad here um, about a quarter of a mile away. Now that was considered when it was placed in the mid 80s as a far enough distance away, you know, to 
quote, protect this archaeological site. But, you know, as we look at this boundary for the Pierre's community and the site cluster, the well pad is well within the boundary of this. So I think what 1980s um, Bureau of Land Management archaeologists, and again, not to cast aspersions, but I think they weren't envisioning the landscape the way we do today. And from the time I've spent with different Pueblo and other Native American colleagues, I don't think they really mapped on to how large that landscape is for contemporary. And I think for um, Native Americans, the Pueblo folks who built this site. So Ruth's study was really trying to capture the impacts on the soundscape as you go out and experience sound there and on the view shed. She found, um, I think, close to 20 oil and gas facilities, either pumping well jacks, um, storage yards, compressor stations that were within the view shed of this amazing, you know, ancient Chaco community. So the conclusion that I think Ruth drew and that I would certainly um, emphasize, reemphasize, is that this landscape was not protected through the federal government's action, and we allowed oil and gas infrastructure to intrude on it. And this is something that we should all work very hard to prevent. Now, you know, Chester, I usually say this, and I didn't at the start of this one, you know, my focus has not been on turning off the oil and gas taps and saying, hey, we're done, you know, we're post oil. Because from my perspective, that's a process we're in the middle of right now. And I think we're going to get to the point where that is the reality. What we're trying to do as a bridging strategy is figure out how to better protect areas like these amazing Chaco and landscapes, the Navajo families living out there currently, the historic Navajo sites, the, the very rich cultural resource record. We're trying to figure out how to protect that and keep the oil and gas in areas that are good for oil and gas, but which don't have the same densities of living people on the, on, on the landscape, don't have the same densities of Chacoan sites, historic Navajo sites, ancient sites. So that's really the, the, the tight line we're trying to walk. And sometimes being in this position, you know, we get people saying we're doing too much to protect them and others saying we're not doing enough. So, you know, that's that's part of the game is trying to figure out how to get the most protection in place. And and um, so that's that's what we're actively working towards. I'll go ahead and stop my share. Sorry, that was a long answer. But Ruth's study is very, very important for what we're doing. And we were thrilled to be able to to help, you know, move that along in a small way. But long answers are good. And um, thank you for clarifying that that tight rope that you walk. Uh, you were talking about the intrusions into these uh, areas and, you know, that kind of, uh, and, and particularly earlier you mentioned the impacts on the vegetation. And uh, so that's something I wanted to um, maybe bring up briefly is uh, about the, say, this equipment coming in and not just uh, disturbing the soil itself, but also bringing in the potential to introduce invasive species. Was any, any of that a part of your study as well? Um, no, it wasn't specifically for what we were doing, but we have partners, um, the Wilderness Society in particular, who focus more on, you know, what we talk about in terms of vegetation, vegetative succession. So natural communities impacted through different types of development, especially in this area, you know, widespread um, oil and gas development, and then what comes in in terms of successive vegetative communities and how that impacts, you know, the Navajo families in particular living out there who are trying to graze, you know, herds still. Because what happens is the invasive areas, um, the areas where invasive landscape and construction-based disturbance happens then tend to produce the Russian thistles, um, some of the other things like knapweed. Well, those then spread from disturbed areas into undisturbed areas. And then we end up with, with a real problem. So, you know, that's not really my, my area of expertise, but um, like I said, we have partners looking at that. And that's definitely one of the concerns that's been raised uh, as BLM and BIA also working on their land management policies. One of the things we're trying to influence right now. Yeah, um, thank you. And yeah, uh, the, these partnerships are um, absolutely uh, essential to the sorts of preservation efforts like the uh, not-for-profit NGOs like, like uh, you work for and, and like we are. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, also shout out to all of our par partner organizations out there for uh, your continued efforts to uh, try to preserve the Mesa. And, um, you know, Paul, I think you bring a, a fantastic perspective about um, the sort of monumental scale of um, preservation projects that are underway right now, like what you are um, so crucially a part of. Um, yeah, and uh, so I think I wanted to get into, if we don't have uh, any more questions about Paul's talk, I think we have um, the perfect amount of time left for uh, archaeology in the news. So we'll start with the uh, shell beads from Santa Barbara, California. And these were traded pretty broadly uh, across uh, not just California, but uh, into the Great Basin and even into the Southwest. Uh, Paul, have you by chance uh, encountered any such uh, shell beads in your career? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's one of the more interesting aspects of working not just on Chaco Insights, but definitely on Chaco Insights, is that we have shell that's coming from all over the place, you know, the, the beads you're mentioning from the Gulf of California, we get a lot of those in different Southwestern contexts. We also get Gulf of Mexico beads, um, other shell pendants, you know, things that are uh, part of necklaces, you know, like the beads and other just larger shell items that make their way up through these trading networks. And, you know, I find it really fascinating. We, we tend to have this sense of the modern world of, of course, being very global and, you know, we have uh, goods traveling worldwide. Well, in the past, things moved around quite a bit as well, given the differences in, in technology and transportation, of course. So uh, people had access to a variety of trade goods. And that's one of the things that makes archaeology super interesting, because with many of these, of course, we can study them. Sometimes the, the shell, the specific shell species, can be tracked merely on that basis, and then we can do trace element studies and really identify where items are coming from. So yeah, it's uh, again, it's just not something I've personally worked with, but all those lines of data feed into understanding, you know, how the ancient world worked. Yeah. Um, thank you again. This is something that, like you said, uh, a lot of people don't uh, uh, seem to grasp the uh, the scale and um, span of ancient economies as being so interconnected and expansive, uh, very much like you compared it to our, our modern global uh, uh, economy. So um, these shell beads are a perfect example of that. And uh, so in, in this article, um, the, uh, the kind of understanding that we had had is that um, shell beads have been made on the um, uh, off the Santa Barbara coast for a while, uh, up to 10,000 years, but at some point uh, we know that they came to be used as a currency. And for quite a while, the uh, sort of common consensus was um, not necessarily to pin down a start date, but that they had been used as currency for at least 800 years. So beginning about um, beginning about 1200 A.D. and this study, which was done by um, let's see here, this study was done by Lynn Gamble, who's kind of a, a powerhouse in California, uh, especially coastal archaeology, uh, kind of re-examined some existing collections of these shell beads, like we talked about, that uh, don't just occur. Um, off the uh, the Santa Barbara coast right there, off, off the channel, but they get traded far into the interior, into um, into the southwest. Um, and so, yeah, uh, she studied these collections uh, and the uh, ones that could be sourced as having been made in this area and what sort of standardization was involved because uh, there, there's a number of uh, theories in the production of these which give us lines of evidence as to when they stop becoming beads and, and start becoming a sort of currency. And what Lynn Gamble determined is that this standardization, these sort of telltale markers of uh, shell beads becoming currency emerge 
about 2,000 years ago, which is, well, uh, significantly older. It's 1,200 years older than uh, the, the, the previous consensus. So that's, I mean, that's pretty incredible. And that's kind of kicking off the theme of these three articles, I think. Um, uh, stuff that's older than we initially thought it was. So then our next article, and uh, Paul, would you like to uh, take this one on the uh, turkey bone tattoo implements? Right, yeah, this was, a, this was an amazing find um, in Tennessee um, of turkey bones, uh, you know, from way back in the 80s, and um, that they had finally been able to date, and the dates came back between about 5,500 and roughly 3,600 years ago. So we're talking to fit it into a scale for folks, you know, sometime 2500 BCE, somewhere in there. This is very early for um, tattooing tools. Um, I'm personally acquainted with a set that are in um, the Aztec Ruins Museum that came out of Aztec um, that date probably in the 1100s, um, you know, CE or AD. So much more recently. Um, you know, we know, of course, that tattooing has been an important part of um, identity for really almost every group that's been studied, you know, where we've been able to, to find the tools or or the skin where folks have actually, the tattoos have actually survived, um, you know, big part of identity for a long time in North America and, and down into South America worldwide as well. So what this tells us is, yeah, this is, a, this is a much older practice that goes back in time. And of course, this is one of the things that um, really fascinates people about archeology span and certainly many of us um, who are archeologists is trying to push back the limits of when we first can detect, you know, this particular artifact, this kinds of behavior. And for me, you know, the artifacts are important clues for that, but I'm, ult I'm ultimately interested in the behaviors that are part of that and how groups were signaling different things. So, yeah, I think that, you know, and I, I know that uh, members of the public who are engaged in this, you know, realize this, but when we talk about firsts in archeology, span and I'm putting parentheses around that, we just have to be real careful because Basically, when we, we have these firsts and we're talking about it, it means that what we're working with is the best dated earliest example of a particular item, in this case, the tattooing tool, tools from Tennessee on turkey bones. I wouldn't be surprised at all to have other tools pop up in the right context somewhere else in North or South America and push this back by 500, 1,000, even a couple thousand more years. So. So when we do talk about these things and we're writing what are essentially these histories of the past, it does kind of behoove us to say, and, and be fairly careful in our language and say, here's what we know, this seems to be the first occurrence of this, but, but not to necessarily, even if we're the folks finding it and maybe the ones, you know, a lot of the work I do in preservation archeology span and my colleagues do is we go back through museum collections. And I think that was partly what happened here um, you know, with some collections from a site dug, you know, more than 30 years ago. So we go back and we're essentially trying to do archaeology on the collections themselves and find interesting things. And honestly, we're trying to reduce impacts to sites and not do so much excavation, which, you know, many of our Native American colleagues and friends tell us is something that doesn't necessarily have to occur. So if we're doing that kind of work, working through the collections, we're going to find a lot of very interesting things. Um, and I think we're going to learn um, a lot about that. But we need to be careful when we use the word first that we're, we're qualifying it and realizing this is what we think is the first. Um, but, you know, then let's build our story from there, but not necessarily get too hung up on that. So uh, for our audience, even though this pushes back the earliest known tattooing in North America by about a millennium, that... Uh, this could be one of those instances where, uh, in fact, it's quite likely this is one of those instances where it was occurring before then, and there may even be evidence that's older, but not as firmly supportable, uh, a little bit shapier, maybe the um, maybe the materials are a bit more degraded, and so this is something to 
Uh, thank you, Paul, for, for reminding our audience about that and, and for reminding our colleagues, because, um, of course, there's, there's always a push to be the, the best, the biggest, the oldest, and um, for, the, for the sake of scholarly rigor, it's uh, great to have that reminder to kind of uh, check ourselves, even when we have something that might qualify of, you know, this is earlier than the, the previous evidence, but, you know, still recognize and entertain the notion that this was probably going on before then. And um, you, actually, I was going to ask you a question, but you already answered it. Uh, because these were made of turkey bone, and we know that turkey bone was um, turkey bone was also one of the materials used to make flutes in the Southwest. I was going to ask if you've uh, encountered any uh, tattooing implements of uh, from turkeys as well. So, sounds like that's the case. Right, right. I, I believe that the instruments at Aztec were made out of turkey bones. So, yeah, yeah, um, and. You know, it's again goes back to the ingenuity of folks um, using the materials that they have to produce just an, an a, amazing array. You know, and this kind of goes to the point you made of about well, we we haven't found everything yet, right? And we've we're only going to find probably doing archaeology. You know, take your pick, something less than 10 or 15 percent of the items ever in use at a particular locale if it's of a certain age. So. You know, for some people that might fill them with a sense of despair, uh, but what I think is really cool is that, you know, by doing the right kind of research and innovative research these days with the technology we can bring, especially the non-destructive technology from those 10 or 15 percent of, you know, what might be a total artifact assemblage that we're never going to see. And then what do we do, Chester? We, we, we try and tell good stories and have those stories be supported by the data. But, um, you know, none of us should get too far away from the idea that we are making good inferences and telling good stories about the past. But I wasn't there. You weren't there. So <laughs> we do the best we can. <laughs> absolutely. I feel absolutely. I feel like I got uh, some of the same words from, from my advisor, uh, advisor uh, Judith Habeck Mosh, about, like, what do we do? We tell good stories. Um, so, uh, right. Wonderful words. So, all right, from uh, revisiting collections to revisiting sites, here is the uh, uh, pictograph from Sulawesi, which the, uh, the author of uh, this article, um, Viviani, had been a part of a team that documented back in the 1980s. And just a few years after, the uh, 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 another group, uh, I, I believe it was a local group, had uh, decided that, uh, in the interest of preservation, that they were going to retouch the uh, the pictograph. Uh, it was only uh, years later, in fact, I, I think in the last uh, maybe four or five years, that uh, some pictographs similar to the one that that you're seeing here were dated to about 44 to 45,000 years ago, uh, making them uh, some of the oldest in the world, and especially uh, such as uh, this example, which is the uh, Maxine, uh, Maxine Albert or Maxine Aubert uh, photo in, um, in the article, that uh, this might be one of the earliest depictions of a uh, of a quadruped, and the, uh, similarly, there might be uh, the earliest depictions of a hunting scene uh, known in the world. And so, what happens when we get these uh, these efforts for preservation? Uh, a better audience is going to remember the uh, the famous instance with the uh, the painting that was rather inexpertly restored in uh, was, was that Italy. Um, and these things happen time and again. And even when it doesn't uh, detract from the visual quality, this impacts our ability to revisit with these new methods to be able to date these things. Um, you know, Paul, as you said, um, back in the 1980s, uh, federal land agencies weren't taking into account the uh, sound sheds and the view sheds. And it, in fact, that's uh, fairly recent in North American archaeology, at, le at least the acoustics part. We also now have um, x-ray fluorescence, which is a way of 
getting the material composition of what uh, pictographs like this one were made out of, which was something that was not really available to archaeologists, at least not as a portable device, uh, in um, in the 80s when the uh, when the author uh, visited this. So this was a, a an interesting kind of like retrospective piece, and um, so. Um, the author kind of goes into some bittersweet feelings about, you know, being a part of documenting these things, but also, you know, what's going on. And then finally, that the, uh, the rate at which these have been degrading, after all, again, they're, they're 44 to 45,000 years old, some of them. So um, the rate of degradation has been very slow for a very protracted period. And all of a sudden, the, um, the rock is deteriorating, they're getting lichen encroachment, the, uh, the pigments are fading, and uh, something's changing. Um, and so yeah, it, he kind of left us on this uh, question of what do we do and how do we uh, continue with conservation when, um, when things start to degrade. But obviously, like, simply restoring and repainting is not a good response to this because that, uh, that impedes us not only now, but impedes archaeologists of the future who might not or who might have methods that we do not have today. Um, any comments on that, Paul? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think that this is perhaps a difference in European archaeology and American archaeology, because I don't know anywhere in the States um, where anyone, any land manager, anyone, you know, with this, uh, especially a pictograph this old, would have ever allowed anyone to alter it or to restore it in that way. You know, and I know that, of course, there's a long, long history of restoring art, works of art in, of, in many media in Europe, and I'm not commenting on that as a bad practice, but with something this sensitive, you know, in a pictograph setting, um, yeah, they pretty much rendered this now unstudiable with, as you said, the X-ray fluorescence, the XRF, any other methods that we have that are completely non-invasive and really would have been able to tell us a lot. So I think in a, in a North American context, the most likely response to this would have been, you know, of course, extensive documentation, which I'm sure has been done at, at various points, but then a program of monitoring yearly, or even if the deterioration is so rapid, you know, two or three times a year, you go out and you measure and you, you track this very carefully and you do LIDAR, you do other photographic methods and really, you know, track this, but you don't intervene and, in, you know, maybe if you're seeing water, a, a pathway for water, there's a way to redirect the water away from the image. You know, I don't know clearly the setting of this, looking at it, if it was horizontal, flat, then you might be able to redirect water. If it's on a vertical face, it might be a way to do it. So there would be a number of indirect methods, I think, to mitigate some of what's going on. And you might ultimately decide it's not mitigatable, um, but to alter it and to, quote, refresh it or restore it is, is as you said, pretty unthinkable in our world. And uh, with the things you're working with out at Mesa Prieta, yeah, right, nobody would ever consider doing that. Yeah. And... For uh, some groups that I've worked with in the past, uh, the preference is to kind of let the landscape reclaim it. Um, mm -hmm. And, the, and right. the level of documentation that we can do non-invasively is uh, superb now, uh, especially uh, with how powerful computers are and some of the great software that we have available. Um, we've got, sorry, I was just making sure that, that you weren't suddenly muted there. Um, we now do 3D modeling, as you know, right. uh, followers of us on uh, on social media and, and our website know. And um, there's uh, there are techniques um, like uh, RTI, which is a way of getting incredibly fine, uh, detailed relief from changing the lighting around and doing a photographic sequence. Uh, there are also ways of retouching images to bring out, especially with with pictographs. Um, much of our audience might be familiar with DStretch, which is a fun tool, and now right. available on a mobile platform. Um, and, right. and yeah, all, all of these things can help bring back some, I mean, bring back a view of something that's fading without actually altering the thing that, that's fading itself. Um, and then, 
this article because he was speculating on the impact of uh, emissions from vehicles on roadways and if that was um, if the carbon from that was acidifying the water and, and, and accelerating the, the degradation in this cave, it made me think of uh, you know, some of what you're talking about, the equipment coming into the Chaco landscape. And maybe it's not the, not necessarily the chemistry of the air in that sense, but simply the intrusion of infrastructure like a road, a pipeline, uh, et cetera, um, and, and the sort of down the line impacts that can have. Like you were talking about with um, the way that water is directed, um, often, uh, invariably, when a road goes in, water has to be redirected to keep the road from washing out. And um, the road itself will continue to try to evolve into a water channel. Um, and so right. what do you do with that water discharge and, and how does that impact the, 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 the hydrology and erosion around these places? Um, all right, well, uh, we are out of time, and Paul, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Um, if people want to reach you and if they want to support Archaeology Southwest, how should they do that? Yeah, great, Chester. It's been my pleasure and honor to be on with you. Um, archaeologysouthwest.org. It's all one word, Archaeology Southwest. Put the extra A in. Um, you can find us there. My email is pread at the same place, archaeologysouthwest.org. A pretty pretty simple Google search will get most of us to pop up. And we have, I think, a really a really nice website with a lot of different things um, for folks to go in and access. If you do Chaco Landscape or Greater Chaco uh, Archaeology Southwest, you can really unlock a lot more information, a couple little films that we've done and our partnership done. So, yeah. My pleasure to be on with you, Chester. Thank you. All right. And uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll see you next month.